A very good morning to all guests and delegates with great joy and immense exultation. We are highly obliged to welcome the dignitary. Here is a hearty welcome, big and warm enough to encompass you all. The CFE Institute. The CFA Institute is a professional organization that provides investment professionals with finance education. The Institute aims to promote ethics, education, and professional excellence standards in the global investment service industry. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our guest for today. Mr. Amit Chakraborty is a director of Global Partnership and Client Solutions of CFA Institute. Mr. Amit leads institutional engagement for CFA Institute. His remit is to build collaborative relationships with financial institutions with a focus on performance, risk, and talent. He also identifies, conceptualizes, and executes impact initiatives, which include India's first young women in investment program, currently running in six countries. Prior to CFA Institute, Mr. Amit was a director at Investment Banking and HSBC, wherein he acted as strategic ad advisor to domestic and international clients on equity capital markets and mergers and acquisitions. Introducing our next guest, Mr. Nikit Yagi. Mr. Nikit is an institutional relations manager at CFA Institute. He eng engages with financial institutions and universities to build relationships and create new opportunities based on mutual collaboration. In his last role before joining the CFA Institute, he worked as a senior manager for the market groups of ICICI Bank, where he managed the forex and the derivative transactions for large bank corporates. Please join me in giving our guests the most cordial of welcomes. I would also like to extend a very special welcome to Mr. Akash Ravan, the program director at IDQ, India's first IFOA accredited university. He has a decade of experience in training and consulting in risk management and analytics and has worked with various multinational companies in various sectors in India. He is also the co-founder of Finstar. He has cleared a total of eight actual papers and is a chartered accountant as well. Akash sir is certainly an all-rounder at what he does. I'd like to call Akash sir to stay to speak a few words. Thanks, Sakshi. Yeah, good morning, all. So, guys, uh, I think the purpose of this entire session is that you guys get information about finance and CFA being one of the most recognized uh, certifications and CFA Institute being one of the most recognized institutes in the financial domain. So the aim is for you to get maximum amount of information and make an informed decision because all of you all now, majorly all of you all come into your final year yeah, where you have to make that shift whether you want to get poorly into insurance or whether you want to get into uh, the financial domain. Yeah. We hope this session gives you the much needed information and help you make that informed decision. I think I have handed over to the speakers. Alright, uh, good morning everyone. Thanks for the warm welcome. I think we got clapped three times. That's awesome. <laughs> So hopefully, like you now, we can deliver some value for you. Like you now, at least like you now during and after the session, nobody falls asleep. So that's kind of our main objective. And if you can have some takeaways from the session, that would be awesome. As well, right? uh, so we have divided this presentation into two parts broadly. You are able to hear me, right? At the back? Yeah. Okay, great. So we have divided the presentation into two parts broadly. So one is just talking about the industry as like you now overall. What is the investment management industry that? We typically talk about at CFA Institute. Uh, what are different kind of roles, uh, profiles, etc., etc. And then, like now, my colleague Nikit will cover more details about the CFA program per se, like, which is probably of more interest to you. Uh, okay. So, on that note, let's get started. Uh, so, like 
now very quickly about CA principles. So we are a global not-for-profit organization. We are based out of the US. Uh, and with offices in the major financial centers of New York, London, Hong Kong. And then we have country offices in like, uh, larger markets like China and India as well. So like, uh, Mumbai is a CA principle. Uh, like, uh, one of two country offices in the world, right? So Beijing in that one. Uh, we are the world's largest association of investment professionals. Uh, we're talking about uh, a current member base of about 190-195,000 investment professionals, right? Now, uh, if just to look at the size of this uh, like, uh, or, or association, okay, so if I look at, let's say the living alumni base of uh, Harvard Business School, arguably one of the most famous living schools in the world. So their alumni base is about 43, 44,000. Right? And we have 190,000 strong. So, and these 190,000 strong uh, professors are like, you know, based on 80 plus countries. So, anywhere you go across the world, uh, like, you know, even in Nigeria, Ghana, as an example, uh, more likely than not, you will meet a CFA charter holder who could help guide, like, you, know, you could build relationships, etc. Et right? So, that's kind of our biggest asset base, like you know, uh, as CFA. Uh, so we are like you know uh, we uh, divide ourselves into societies so because the CEO Council has offices only in a select set of cities. Uh, so we have uh, local societies in like, you know, eighty plus countries I was talking about. So for example, uh, India has a CEO Council in India. And Nigeria would have a CEO Council in Nigeria. And Singapore would have a CEO Council in Singapore, etc. Et et so these are basically members of that location who get together and who propagate our mission in that geography, right? And what's our mission? Our mission is to lead the investment management industry uh, by promoting the highest standards of ethics, education, and professional excellence. And then we added this phrase uh, about 20 years back for the ultimate benefit of society, right? So ethics is something which is front and central to everything and anything that we do uh, within CFN. And that's reflected in all our programs as well, like whether it's the program, uh, CIP program, Ethics has about twenty percent weightage um, across the across the curriculum, right? Which is huge. And uh, funnily enough, um, CFA program candidates in India find ethics as one of the toughest. Uh, not because uh, people in India are not ethical, but it's more about awareness. Like, you know, how do you even identify like, not that you're an ethical dilemma kind of a scenario, right? So Nikita and I, like, we also do these ethics workshops at institutions, like for a working professional as well as universities, just to make people aware of what is an ethical dilemma, you know? and because if you are not aware, then you cannot address it, right? so that awareness itself is very, very important, fundamental to how we work. Right? Yeah, I've already covered uh, like, you know, uh, this in my previous slide, uh, the only additional point is that uh, we work closely with 25,000 plus uh, investment management finance services firms across the world. Including the, any, including all of the financial services forms in India, right? Uh, we also have uh, 600 plus affiliated universities. Uh, these are affiliated with the CFA program. Uh, what it means, like, you know, that, that the program fills in content from the CFA program, right? And a lot of our programs are recognized by regulators across the world. So in India, uh, like, you know, if we look at three core roles in the investment management industry, which is portfolio management. Uh, uh, investment advisors and research analysts. So for portfolio management and uh, investment advisors, SEBI recognizes the same program. And we're working on research analysts also covering the recognition safety program. That's working programs. And like now we started our life uh, same year as India, that now 1947 was started. So last year was our 74th anniversary, just like the for, for India as well. Okay, quick question. Uh, do you know any of these guys? No? No one knows any one of them? What about now? Sorry? No, we can give them please pay but sir, you can tell them. Okay, sorry, my like I wanted to know beyond the name, like the word is guys. You know, obviously the names have put in cross, right? So who is that? Who is, who is Prima, Sour, Nikesh, or Dhamni? Anyone? You haven't heard of any of these names? 
Anyone, come on. Okay, so very quickly, uh, so Navneet Munoz is the CEO and Managing Director for HDFC Ames. This is a top three asset management company in this country. Like, uh, he was uh, CIO for SBI Mutual Fund before he took on the CEO role. Uh, Where he brought SBI Mutual Fund from number six to like, uh, the, the, the largest asset management in this country. So that's Navneet Munoz, right? Uh, the case Arora, like, you know, he made his mark at Google. Okay, uh, in the US, so that's where he mm -hmm. made millions of dollars. Then he became the CEO for SoftBank, SoftBank mm -hmm. International. Anybody knows who is SoftBank? Okay, who is SoftBank? Come on. What is SoftBank? SoftBank is the world's largest bank. Uh, I would say the world's largest, but it's one of the largest one. Like it's a Japanese firm that you know, uh, it's investing in companies across the world, and it's a, it's a massive investor in India. Right? Uh, so, Mula, for example, is one of their biggest investors. Right? So, Nikesh Arora was the CEO for SoftBank International. Uh, right now, he is the CEO for Palo Alto Networks in California. Okay. Prem Watsa is known as the Canadian Warren Buffett. Now, everybody knows Warren Buffett, Jimmy, right? So he's known as a Canadian Warren Buffett because of his astute investments uh, across the world. Like, you know, and, like, you know, maybe uh, like, you know, less valued companies which he then invests in some things and it makes it more valuable, right? So he's the he's the founder of Fairfax and they uh, they, they own Bangalore Airport in India, as an example of the Indian investment. It's a Bangalore Airport is in fact Fairfax, which is pretty much. So why have I put these three names here? Any any ideas? Oh, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yes, they are all CFA charter holders, and the reason for putting these three names here is like, you know, this is, this will like, you know, demonstrate the different career paths that the CFA charter holder would have, right? So, Navneet is a typical portfolio manager that's very makes mark with Morgan Stanley, Virda Sandler, Virda Sandler, and SBM, which is now the CEO for one of the largest asset management companies in the country. Because they're a walk in like, you know, a tech company like Google, right? Obviously, a finance focused person. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, like, you know, SoftBank is a like, you know, private equity investor, and now he's Palo Alto Network. So, that's a different career path. And Prem Watsa is, uh, is an investor, like, you know, a value investor uh, who invests in terms of right? So, just an example or a flavor of the different career paths that the CFA chapter would have. Okay. All right. So, like, you know, now that we have given you have very rough flavor of what CFA charters could do or what it could become. This is the landscape in India, okay, from the investment management industry. This is where we as CFS do engage primarily in. Okay, so the wider financial service industry is there, but this is where our core is. Okay. So the asset management industry, so what I mean by that is mostly the mutual funds, which I'm assuming all of us know about, you know, all of us invest, right? Uh, it's a relatively small industry in India at this point of time. It's only $500 billion of assets under management. The reason I say it's small is uh, it is across the country, okay, in India. Uh, BlackRock, which is the largest asset manager in the world, uh, they, on their own, manage $10 trillion of assets, right? So that's like three, and three times, more than three times of India's GDP, okay? And the entire industry in India is $500 billion of assets under management, today, okay? Uh, only 45 companies uh, like, are in this industry, so uh, and mostly domestic. Like uh, the only uh, a lot of the foreign players, like uh, including the banks like Goldman, Deutsche, etc., exited this industry. They could not survive, right? and we can talk about it in a different uh, platform. Uh, so it's mostly domestic. The only foreign players uh, remaining in the country in the asset management industry are uh, Franklin Templeton, HSBC, uh, Invesco, and then Nippon. Otherwise, it's mostly domestic. Okay? Uh, so that's the asset management industry, uh, like, uh, roughly. Okay? The wealth management industry. Uh, this is where they like, uh, work with high net worth individuals, like, uh, rich people, uh, like, uh, NRIs, etc. Uh, they manage about three hundred fifty dollars, like, fifty billion dollars of assets. Like, uh, we call it assets under advice in asset management because they advise clients on where to manage or and, like, uh, uh, invest on clients' behalf. Okay. Uh, again, mostly domestic, so we will have large like, uh, foreign players and changes there, uh, for example. So it's not a 
five years in Right, so mostly domestic uh, companies, but we have standard channel, like, we have some Julius Bear, standard channel, etc. present in this space as well. Uh, this is a space where uh, there is a significant number of entrepreneurs, right? It's a great way to like not go on, okay, in the right manner because the potential scope is huge and enormous. So, unlike the asset management industry, where there are only 45 players, in the wealth management industry, like well, there are a lot of small size, mid size firms, and they have been like not. Very successful. <coughs> for entrepreneurs. Okay. Uh, I'll come to global investment hub at the end. Uh, third one is alternatives. So this is where we are talking about private equity, venture capital uh, kind of you know, players. They invest about roughly about fifty billion dollars in India on an annual basis. Right. Most of the larger private equity VC players uh, from across the world are present in India. Uh, irrespective of whether to do investments or not, it's important for them to have a presence in India because when they raise their funds from their limited partners, uh, one of the questions that they ask is, like, you know, are you present in India? Because India still is the uh, one of the fastest growing markets and power scope for growth, right? Uh, so many wealth funds, uh, like you know, from Middle East, from Europe, and pension plans from North America in particular are all present in India or investing in this country, right? Having said that, the team sizes in these firms are very small, like typically 20, 30 people max, right? So overall, from an employee number perspective, it's a small industry, right? Finally, the global investment hub. Okay, this is very interesting. Like you now, uh, almost all the large financial services players in the world, uh, you know, including the banks like Goldman, Barclays, JP, HSBC, or even asset management firms like BlackRock, State Street, Northern Trust who may or may not have a local business in India, have a massive presence in this country, right? So BlackRock, for example, the largest asset manager in the world, uh, they don't do business in India, right, at this point. But they have the second largest employee base of anywhere in the world in India, right? Now, this industry started out as call centers and PPOs, okay, about 20, 25 years back. Since then, it has evolved to be like a lot more value added services. So almost all the roles, like, you know, including like you know, portfolio managers, research analysts, etc., are based on India now. In fact, like now a lot of the banks, when the sell side research analysts, they are based out of India. They travel to Europe, travel to Japan, travel to you know, Singapore to cover companies and then come back and write the reports and lead analysis. Right. So almost everything is done. So the only roles which have not moved to India are salespeople. Sales people have to go and make plan on a daily basis, which is not possible to do for India, right? Otherwise, it's evolved and it's like you now great environment, great salaries, uh, and good growth opportunities, etc. So, it's very satisfying, right? So, that's a broad industry landscape. Now, how is the environment in India like? Okay, uh, so we've got very robust regulators, youngest regulators in this country, like uh, SEBI, PFRDA, IUBIA, as examples, uh, very open to engaging and Enhancing their policies in this country, like, you know, making it more investor friendly, helping it grow, etc. Uh, sorry, any questions at any point, please feel free to just speak up. Okay, um, no comments. Okay. Uh, the industry itself has a lot of scope for growth. Uh, like I said, only $500 billion of assets under management uh, in the asset management industry. Uh, to give you perspective, right? So, uh, any household, like on, on an average in India, if you have 100 rupees of surplus, household surplus, so if you earn a salary or a business income, whatever expenses this business spend, then let's say you're left with 100 rupees of surplus, right? Business will invest. As of today, only 5% of that gets invested in mutual funds. Okay. So that's why it says there is a lot of scope. In fact, compared this with the China, about 25% of household surpluses uh, get invested in mutual funds. So there's a 5x growth potential in India. In the US, it's about 35%, right? So the competitive segments are 7x growth potential for India. A okay? uh, <coughs> couple of areas of concern when, interest, when it comes to interest investors coming to India. So one is corporate governance. There's been a lot of like you know, like you know, a lot of uh, growth in this space, but still corporate governance remains a massive concern for most interest investors when they're looking at the country. Okay? And also ease of doing business. Right. Now, even though uh, the government talks about like uh, single window clearances, approvals, etc., it's still not easy to set up a business or do business in India, right? So these are still areas of uh, like uh, improvement for the country when it comes to interest investment. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, having said all of this, things, India remains one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Right? So we are trillion, trillion dollars, and we are uh, we are poised to grow a lot faster in the next few years. Now, I've broadly covered this, like you know, from an investment industry. So we're talking about asset managers, wealth managers, and asset owners. So we don't really have asset owners in India. So asset owners are more like sovereign wealth funds, pension plans, etc. So EPFO, for example, could be EPFO is the employee program fund organization where all of us contribute uh, salaries to our working for our uh, So that could be an uh, asset owner where they invest in different markets. LIC again could be an asset owner as well because all of the extra money that we put in needs to be invested somewhere. Right? Uh, but then, like now, the other areas are banking, the overall banking, like all of the large corporate. Retail banks that we have, right? Uh, investment banking, uh, which is uh, what I used to do in my previous life, so more merchant equities and uh, equity capital markets, like IPOs, debt capital markets, like bond issues, etc. So that's an area where our chart holders and them will be working. Uh, treasury, uh, this is a very interesting area. So large corporates like Reliance Industries, Larson and Kuzbo, etc., uh, which makes a lot of profit from their businesses, different businesses, infra business, petroleum business. So they, what do they do with these profits? Obviously, they can distribute it to shareholders, but then they also invest in the markets. Right? Like that is <coughs> called a treasury. How do you manage your own money? <coughs> so to give you an example, uh, uh, an LMP, like uh, uh, the treasury department run by Michael Govindan, he on his own generates profits of about 150 to 100 million dollars every year. This is huge. Okay, so this is not part of the core business, but this is whatever money is being saved as net profit invested in different asset classes and things. So that's an area where CFA chart code is working. Uh, and finally, tax and audit. You know, tax and audit is typically an accountant's kind of domain. But more and more what you're seeing is that you know, the accountants need a more broader like, you know, uh, level of financial understanding and knowledge to deliver a more holistic um, like, uh, tax-oriented, accounting-oriented enterprises. Right? Uh, just a flavor of the kind of companies that hire CFA program candidates and CFA charters in India, like you know, domestic firms, global firms, all of them are there, right? And below, we have just put in some of the roles. And this again, like you know, the spectrum of roles in the industry. Okay, okay so uh, this is an interesting slide. So we uh, did a survey which, uh, like now, uh, did about, I think about 110,000. Professionals, uh, working professionals, working in different finance functions across the world, right? And we asked them, like, now, do you see uh, a significant change in the <coughs> kind of rules that you're doing today to service, like, now, five or ten years down the line, okay? And very interestingly, almost, like, now, um, even if you look at an equity and this relationship manager, right, almost 30% of them feel that, you know, their jobs are going to be drastically different from in five years' time, they say this, but it is today. If you look at a trader, a sales guy, or a fintech person, uh, almost 60% believe that you know, it will be different, very, very different from what they are doing today, right? And then the, the small greenish bar top that, 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 that reflects that this job won't exist at all. So about 10% of fintech people feel that you know, whatever they are doing today, that job role would not exist in five years time at all. It just disappeared, okay? So the point of this slide is that you know you name any role in the financial service industry. It's going to be get uh, like you know, dramatically disrupted in five or ten years. Right? So why am I showing this slide? Because it means that you know you as a person, as a young person, or even me and the kid and class as well, we have to constantly upgrade ourselves, otherwise we'll become redundant. Right? So just getting a like you know, nice degree from a credible college is a great start, but that journey has to continue lifelong. Okay, you cannot stop. Otherwise, we might have to become redundant. We'll stop growing. Okay. Now, what are the sources of this job role disruption that we can talk about? Right? Uh, not surprisingly, like, now the top two reasons are fintech and sustainability. Okay. So, like Larry Fink, who is the founder of BlackRock, and he leads BlackRock even today, right? Uh, he believes that uh, BlackRock will eventually, in five, six years' time, will not hire a single person. Doesn't matter what job role, if he or she doesn't have both a fin finance and a tech background. Okay. Both of these roles are critically important. Both of these uh, companies are critically important. So finance and tech is important, right? 
So and that's reflected by 71% 70 of the people who spoke. Okay. FinTech is going to the biggest job. Okay. The second one is sustainability, or ESC as we call it, like you know, farm products, right? So people with uh, like you know, any role out there needs to take into board, take into consideration environmental, social, and governance factor for our understanding of it or adoption of ESG standards, sustainable standards, etc. Et 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 right? uh, and then you have regulatory requirements, food testers, and so on. Right? But the top two are very key, and these are themes that are not going to change quickly. They are going to remain uh, with us for many, many, many years going forward, right? And we already see that in our life, sustainability. So climate change, like you know, pollution, like you know, winters are like you know, colder, summers are hotter, etc. Et so this needs to be reflecting every day. So then we ask, like, you know, what are the kind of skills that are uh, going to be important to uh, build a successful investment management career over the next five ten years, right? So a lot of us, especially in India, like, you know, we focus a lot on technical skills, like, you know, uh, uh, like you know, when at CA, for instance, when you, whenever we organize a workshop, and if there's anything to do with finance or valuation or accounting, you know, we get a pet house, right? But then when we do a soft skills related area, a leadership related area, influencing related area also, we don't see many people learn because everybody feels that technical skills is like the most important skill. It is, right? But if you look at this pie chart, only 14% of people believe that uh, like, no, technical skills are the most important, right? Uh, a lot of people talked about soft skills, okay? A lot of people talked about leadership skills, right? Obviously, this, uh, the proportion of technical, soft, and leadership skills will change as you grow up, right? So initially, maybe technical skills still remains a majority focus, but as you grow up, like not soft skills and leadership skills, importance relevance gets growing, right? So what is TCF skills? Because forty-nine percent people felt that TCF skills are the most important. Anyone knows what is TCF skills? <coughs> Can you guess what is TCF skills? Okay, good, good attempt, right? So, TCF skills, like literally, if you look at T, right? So, this is the uh, horizontal bar and this is the vertical bar, right? So, what it means is like, you know, that you have very strong core expertise in one area. This is the vertical line, right? So, whether it's actual sciences, whether it's like, you know, investment management via CFA, whether it's FRM focused, like a risk management skill, etc. So, you've got very strong in depth knowledge in one area. And then, this horizontal bar is that you have a broad, strong understanding about all other things. So, as I have like, you know, uh, in a typical MBA program, as an example, they teach you marketing, software sales, entrepreneurship, etc. Et the reason being that you know, when you go out and walk out there, you need to have a good understanding about all of these things. Right? So, that's key. Right? You know, strong understanding about all different elements of the company, of the organization, of the of a career, but very strong in depth skills in one particular area, which is the horizontal line. 49% believe that's going to be the most important. As I said, like now, uh, the mix <coughs> changes as you grow in your career. In the early careers, like now, uh, uh, perspective, like now, technical skills still have good strong relevance. But as you grow, like now, in your in your, in your life in your career, uh, the TCF skills, the soft skills, the leadership skills relevance grows, and technical skills relevance reduces over a period of time. Uh, Okay, so um, that was the industry. Uh, any questions, anyone on the investment management? We can talk later as well, but any questions at this point of time? So the easiest way not to fall asleep is to speak up. Okay, that's what I used to do. <laughs> anyone is getting bored. Any questions? No? Okay, uh, what I'll do is like, you know, I'll cover, um, so before coming to the CFA program, I'll cover. Uh, Two other programs that we have at CF Institute that are relevant uh, to build a career in the industry. Uh, as I mentioned, like now, uh, two of the biggest disruptors of roles in the industry are fintech and sustainability. Right, so not going to cover fintech in today's session, but ESG is something that we will cover very quickly. Okay. So uh, the World Economic Forum uh, they did a like now, global survey uh, last year. Right, to try to identify the most severe risk over the next 10 years. Okay. And this is their this is the outcome of the survey, right? Now if you look at it, eight out of the top ten risks that have been identified are to do with the environment and social factors. 
<coughs> climate action, extreme weather, biodiversity loss, social cohesion errors, livelihood crisis, infectious diseases, human environmental damage, natural resource crisis. So all of them have to do with environment and social crisis. Right? Uh, to be honest, like you know, debt crisis is also a governance uh, concern. Yeah. Debt crisis happens when a company is not well run, it leverages itself too highly, like, you know, and it's not able to like, support its uh, debt repayments or interest repayments, etc. And even geoeconomic concerns, just right, uh, when you look at a Ukraine Russia crisis today, also has to do with ESG, like, you know, lack of governance per se, okay, not managing some of the geopolitical crisis problems, right? So, bottom line is that almost all of the risks that have been identified are to do with sustainability the related to okay. Um, and then when we, like I was telling us, you know, we also did a survey of about 1 million profiles on LinkedIn. We tried to identify how many of these 1 million profiles have some ESG or sustainability skills, right? And then we looked at job postings, okay? Let's look for some ESG or sustainability related skills, right? What we found was that there's a 10x gap between supply and demand, right? So what it means is that if there are 100 job roles, which are looking for ESG or sustainable skills, right? There are only 10 people who have some of those skills. Okay. So huge potential for people to acquire ESG related skills and like, you know, get a good like, you know, career path, right? Uh, one of my bosses, uh, like of Paul Moody, he used to work for Barclays investors uh, in, uh, in London, okay, uh, in the ESG space, like he joined us last year. You're saying like now the young people who are working with him just to create power and present business. Okay, they didn't really know much about ESG, the but they're just creating power and present business. Just on the back of it, because they reflected that in the resume, they could get ESG for this job. Okay, so that's how big the demand for ESG skills are, right? Even in India, like now some of the larger ratings agencies, for example, like a Morningstar, uh, indexes like MSCI, right, Interstate, etc. They're literally like you know, pulling people from each other's company. Okay, not the best way to do business, but because they're not able to find the right skills. Okay, even if they're training people, people are leaving because the demand is a lot more than the supply of people. Okay, so this is that like you know, the CFA Institute came out with this program called Certificate in ESA. <laughs> uh, it is a qualification created by a practitioners, ESA practitioners, to integrate ESA factors to that investment decision making. That's going to be reflected in almost all of the companies that we work with as an assessment investment. Uh, so we have had about actually now about 35,000 people have gone through the program globally, right? Including about 1,000 people in India. Okay. Uh, it's a self-paced program. Uh, the study time is 100, 130 hours. Okay. Uh, there's no formal entry requirement, so there's you don't have to be like not graduate or anything as in a college student school to get signed up with it. And it's endorsed by the UN principles of responsible investment, the FBI. Okay. Uh, it's an expensive program, to be honest, for India, for India perspective, it's $95. Uh, it leads to a two hour 20 minutes exams. Uh, and then, like, you know, you get a you know, fancy ESG certificate degree, which you can recommend on your LinkedIn. So, both Nikhil and I, from today, we are going through this program just on that process. Uh, the second program that we have, sorry, okay. Sir, uh, I come from a background where no one in my family comes from a finance financial. So we try to find finance in every single company. For example, Nestle, which doesn't directly deal with finance, but finally has some finance in there. How many, like, uh, apart from Deloitte, which are mostly in finance, how many such persons can come from schools? Now, like, uh, what percentage of how many employees are from the finance world in a company which is not in the like how many finance employees do you require? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So, like, you know, if you look at a typical corporation, okay, like a Nestle would be an example, so Nestle, LNP, Reliance Industry, anything like you know, Procter and Gamble, like, you know, whatever, like any company you look at, right? So, there is, they have a something called a finance and accounts team, okay, you know, finance team. Now, this finance team has got a multiple level of things. One is like not just taking care of your accounting needs, right? So, preparing your financial statements, taxes, and auditing, etc., which is typically done by a chartered accountant, right? Uh, but not everyone is <laughs> a chartered accountant. So, that's 
one role. Okay. The second role is uh, around corporate finance in general. Right? So Nestle, for example, uh, grows organically by like coming up with a new product in the R and D house. But then they also go and acquire businesses. Okay. So if they see there's a small Indian company, it's a new product. product. They see a lot of growth potential in Nestle. They want to acquire it. And they don't do that on an, uh, an ongoing basis across the world. Right? That's where the corporate finance team of Nestle will come to the picture, where they will constantly evaluate you know, opportunities out there in the market, figuring out whether it's the right fit for it, if it's the right fit, and how do you value that company, and then use investment bankers or direct investors to negotiate with the company <laughs> to get a deal done. So that's corporate finance. Okay. So those teams are not big in size, but they are very critical and very good size. Okay. The third kind of team is treasury. Okay, like I mentioned in the other slide. So whatever Nestle is making is net profit on an ongoing basis, right? That is to invest in something, okay? For a rainy day, like, you know, who knows, Nestle might have a massive loss next year. Or whatever, like, you know, COVID happened, like, how the product didn't get sold, okay? So what do you do? How do you still have to survive? So you have to invest your money, just like we do as individuals. That's a treasury team. This treasury team will go share investing to different parts. They, they could buy real estate, they could invest in private equity, electric capital. They could do mutual funds, they could have like you know, anything, all of this investment, right? So the regs of trading as well, they can invest in sales share market. Right? So these are some of the roles that exist in a corporate team. You know, the finance team, the corporate finance team, and then the uh, you know, treasury team. Right? Now, CFA per se is relevant for the second and third part. What the finance and accounting team is the way they are doing accounting for the financial institution, but the corporate does it help? Yeah. Okay, so uh, very quickly, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so I wanted to know, like, you mentioned the four skills, right? The four skills that you need. So the technical skills you get through the papers and everything. So how about the other three? How do you develop those? Or is there a company that you So that's where, like, you know, an environment like this really helps. Okay, so you have to develop some soft skills, right? You know, Let's say there's a team project that you have to work on. Like, you know, the four of four of you have to meet them, right? Now, how do you influence a team member with your top work? You know, this is the path that is the right path to go. So, influencing is not necessarily because you are the boss, but you are your own peer, right? So, within the peer, you have got some other shape of this, like an outgo group. Your influence is key, how you present yourself, how, you, how credible you come across. That is a soft skill. Okay. The relationship that you build with all of, all of your peers here, right? How many friends do you have? You can mix out more projects. Okay. That's a soft skill. Okay. Relationship, your network is one of the biggest assets that you can have. Okay. Talking to a liquid and me, like a building a connection with a car, right? Anyone who comes and talks to you, that's relationship, that's soft skill. Okay. That's critically important. Okay. So soft skills is a lifelong journey. Okay. Even your relatives, like you know, your friends or friends, like how do you connect with them? LinkedIn. Sir, I need a job. This is my CV. Can you help me? That's not networking or relationship. But if somebody has reached out to me, got an agenda, I have an agenda, I check your background. Okay. Have you done investment banking? Do you want to invest in real estate? I need to have a quick chat with you just to figure out why you want to invest. Why would I not be okay to go and have a quick chat with you? And then you Two years down the line, you need a job. Are you the first one to help you? No. Then you don't even have to ask for it. So that's how you build the trust. It's just by the end. Etc. Right? I mean, this is, I'll, I'll just digress for a minute. Like, you know, uh, Nikita and I were traveling to Pune, like, you know, two weeks back. Okay? And uh, we used it, the, the car driver. We thought it was the most enterprising guy, and I could learn so much from him. Okay, he during COVID when everybody is complaining, everybody is struggling, he bought a house with earnings from COVID. You know how he did that, right? So he hired a car. Okay, so a lot of the international travelers were stuck in Mumbai because Mumbai airport was still working. So they were stuck. They, they got into Mumbai airport. They had to quarantine in a hotel in Mumbai, but they are from all parts of the country. 
So he hired a car and he offered his services to drop them to different parts. So he went to Tamil Nadu, like Karnataka, Kerala, etc. etc. Right? And he's charged them one lakh rupees for five people in his car. Okay? He made multiple trips. Now his thing was like, now cops are going to stop me when I travel, right? So he, he joined Janta, uh, no, sorry, Samadwari party, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so he was a political speaker of Samadwari party in his car, and whenever like my house was coming, he's like, I'm a political worker, I'm doing a service, I'm not charging them anything. So he was lying, okay? So he bought a, like, obviously a small place for about 20 lakhs in Sakinaka here, through earnings from COVID, right? Then we asked him, sir, why did you join Samadwari party in Mumbai? Okay, Samadwari Dark Party doesn't have a president. And he said, well, the locally, and he's like a Hindu guy, a familiar Hindu guy from Mumbai, is born and brought up. He said, all of the people around me are mostly from UP, and there are a lot of Muslims in my locality, right? So Samadwari party is more like you know, famous, popular within there. And I started working with them, volunteering with them. And because I was a Hindu and there are a lot of Muslims, they looked up to me and saying, that, wow, even a Hindu guy is helping us so much, right? <laughs> so, so, very enterprising guy, right? Then it's like, to survive in Mumbai, I did at least two, three businesses. So, he's like, using his political affiliation with Samadhi party. He's not a college in his, he's a very opportunistic guy. Right? He opened a Vara house then in the, like, you know, next to the Mantra, you know, right? <laughs> yeah, so, <not> that, right? <laughs> so, this is soft skills, okay, you know? He is not educated, he's probably not even past class 8, 9, okay? but he has this business understanding, right? And very, really, I mean, I'm sure that Gujaratis are born with that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Does it have, I mean, yeah. sorry, long, long answer. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so moving on, uh, so the next certificate program, very briefly at this point, is Investment Fund Business Certificate, right? Now, you guys are finance students, okay, but like you know, uh, there are a lot of people who are not necessarily looking to become a portfolio manager, fund manager, or investment banker, research analyst, etc. Right? But then you still want to get a good, strong foundational level of what the industry is about. You know, it could help in your personal finance decisions as well, like where do you invest, how do you invest, etc. Right? So for all of these people who are not hardcore. Like you know, core finance focused people. Uh, there's a program called Investment Fund Business Certificate we have. It just gives you a, like you know, if you look at CFA program, it's just three levels: level one, level two, level three. Obviously, it's tough to pass. It takes a long time. So, Investment Fund Business Certificate covers all of the breadth of the CFA program without going to the depth of it. Okay, so it gives you a very nice foundation program. And this is something that we launched like you know, recently in February uh, this year. Um, and again, this is like I said, it covers the breadth of the CFA program, so almost everything that is there. Okay. So on that note, I'll pass it on to Nikit, and we can do more questions later as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Amit, and thanks everyone for being such a nice audience. I can see most of you are still awake, so I think that's a success. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try not to change the situation, but I mind that. Clapping reduced. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what they do after my <laughs> So what I'm going to do is cover the details about CFA program. I think uh, Amit has already shared two other certificates that we have, ESG and Investment Foundation. Uh, but CFA program remains our flagship program. And before I go into this and just to understand the level of detailing that I need to cover. Uh, how many of you knew about CFA program or CFA institute before you came for this session today? Okay, so quite a bit of you. Are there any CFA candidates or aspirants who are either registered or looking to register for CFA program? I have You cleared everyone. Okay, nice. What's your name? Rohil. Rohil. Okay, nice. And yours? So you have already registered? I have registered for it, not paid in how do you register without paying? You have created an account on the CFA Institute website, but not selected an exam to set for. Okay. Have you started preparing? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Okay. So good. So I think uh, on a majority of you already know about CFA Institute and CFA program, but I'll still like to cover some of the basic details, right? Uh, so the CFA program journey covers three parts: level one, level two, and level three. And not to mention you have to clear one level before you move on to the next level. <laughs> uh, so what we do in level one? So level one is basically uh, your knowledge and comprehension. We try to equip you with the tools 
that you would require to do investment analysis and portfolio decision making, right? So what does it cover? It covers stuff like quantitative methods, so hypothesis testing, uh, quantitative series. Uh, you would have already done some of it as a part of your actual studies, right? We talk about economics, again something you would have already covered. So we cover both micro as well as microeconomics. Uh, we cover a little bit about the financial reporting and analysis part, but mainly focus towards investment tools. Uh, some bit of corporate finance, how do you make decisions about <coughs> taking on a new project, this is the NPV, IRR of the project, the cash flows, etc. Uh, so once you have an understanding, and of course, the other tools also, equity, fixed income, derivatives, they are also part of the of the level 1 curriculum, but this is the main focus area. So once you go through level 1 and you pass the examination, level 2 focuses on the application of the tools that you have learned in level 1, right? So how do you use these tools, the quantitative methods, the FRA, corporate finance decisions, to actually value an asset class, right? And it could be any asset class, it could be an equity, it could be a fixed income, derivatives, there are many alternative investments like private equity, commercial real estate, etc. So how do you actually use all that information to value these types of classes, right? So that's the focus of level 2. And some people, uh, and most of the people who go through this journey, they say that it is one of the difficult levels to pass because the curriculum is very much focused on the valuation and implementation aspect. And once your level 2 is clear for you, you move on to level 3, which is about the synthesis or evaluation of the knowledge that you have already gained to actually make portfolio decision making, right? So how do you understand client's requirement for investment? Where does he want to invest? How do you understand asset allocation? Where to put his money, right? How much to put in one pocket, how much to put in another pocket? And how do you create investor uh, objectives about investment, time, return, etc, etc. So you actually create a portfolio for your customers. It could be an institutional customer like an EPFO or a solid wealth fund. It could be a retail customer like you and me who invest in mutual funds, etc. Right? So that's the broad journey of uh, the CFA examination. At the core of all these three levels, as Amit already mentioned, is ethics. So ethics is a very important component of all of these three levels. We have certain courses in standards and a lot of case studies. And to pass ethics, a person has to understand the nuances and the little details of ethical conduct. Right? So once you go through this journey, a very obvious question would be, what can I do with my CFA charter? What can, can I do with my certification or clearing level 1, level 2, level 3, etc. So uh, the chart on the, on the slide actually tries to portray the different kind of roles uh, which people who have already been through this journey are currently doing, right? And you can see they are doing all kinds of stuff. So they are into equities, fixed income, private equity, foreign currency, indexes, etc, etc. But a majority of them are into portfolio management profiles, followed by research, quantitative analyst, and investment analyst. And then we have the other profiles like wealth managers, investment strategists, traders, sales agents, etc. Et right? But <laughs> it's majorly focused on equity, fixed income, private equity in the portfolio management and in the research investment side. Now we ask the candidates who successfully clear this examination as to what is the key or kunji to passing this examination, right? What made you successful versus somebody who could not pass an examination? And what they say is that the amount or the number of hours that you have to spend to prepare for this examination is somewhere close to 300 hours, right? Per level, not for the total journey. So per level of this examination, you have to invest 300 hours of focus study. Uh, it generally takes around 2 to 5 years to clear the entire journey, depending on what is your existing knowledge of finance, how comfortable you are with these subjects, uh, as well as what kind of time availability you have. So if you are in a job, probably you would have lesser times to study. So Amit and I, we are doing this ESG certificate. We literally don't find any time during the weekdays to study for the program. But as a student, maybe you have more time at your hand. Okay. Uh, the CFA program, uh, no, you don't have more time. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. <laughs> so, the CFA program curriculum, uh, which is available in the form of a very nice digital ecosystem, right, available in a very fun to learn way, is the most recommended way to learn for this and prepare for this. Event. Now, of course, you have many different uh, short notes, juice notes, uh, prep providers who are uh, trying to tell you or teach you how to pass the examination, but I think. If your objective is to really learn something out of it and not just clear the examination, uh, you should prefer the curriculum part to 
pursue this journey, right? Because it's a trove of treasure which has a lot of input from our charter holders and industry practitioners. Coming to the exam details, how does the examination look like? So probably about from one person, I think Rahim can tell you. Rahim, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Sorry. Uh, <coughs> on the examination day, there are two sessions, a morning session and an afternoon session. Each of these sessions is 2 or 15 minutes long. Uh, as a candidate, you are supposed to attempt 90 questions, which are MCQ, in both these sessions. There will be an optional study uh, refreshment break of half an hour in between, which you can avail of. Uh, otherwise, for scheduling this examination, you have a 7 to 10 days window. Right? So, CFA level 1 examination is conducted 4 times in a year, February, May, August and November. In each of these windows, depending on the location, so I am assuming Mumbai would be a preferred location for many of you. You would have a 7 to 10 days window during which you can select a date and a test center on you know in which you want to appear for the examination. Uh, so centers are available in Mumbai, in Navi Mumbai, and we are planning some more sessions. Uh, centers in Pamir, etc. for people who come from far. Uh, then we offer certain kind of scholarships uh, for. Oh, yes. uh, is there any negative mark in CFL? No, there's not. So you can guess all you want to guess. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think this is a very interesting slide, especially for students, because they want to know about the scholarships part. Uh, is there any financial aid available to students? Uh, so we have something called an university application program, where we support some students to pursue this journey. And those students are given a scholarship called the Student Scholarship, where their overall fee is reduced to $350 for level 1, level 2 or level 3, whichever examination they are pursuing. Uh, we also have something called an access scholarship, which is open to anybody who feels they have a financial constraint to pay the examination fee, right? Uh, so if you think that it is difficult for you to afford the full program fee for level 1, level 2, uh, you can go to CFA Institute's website in the access scholarship tab. There is a statement of purpose that you will have to write, so an essay on what is your current situation, why you think you are not able to pay the fee, etc. And submit it. Uh, the global team reviews these applications and the students or candidates who are selected for this scholarship, their overall fee component is reduced to $250 plus the local government taxes. So that is the overall price that you will have to pay if you are selected for one of these scholarships. We also have something specially for women and I can see that there are a lot of women in our school today. Uh, so, if you do not qualify for either a student or an access scholarship, but you still wish to pursue a career in finance, uh, you can also arrange the women's scholarship. Again, the process is same. Just go to our website, select women's scholarship, log in and apply and put in a statement of purpose. Uh, if your application is selected, your overall pricing will get reduced to $350. Right? Not all of you or many of you who apply for scholarship might get it depending on total number of scholarships that are awarded for that year. So we have launched something which specifically for students and candidates in India, which is called the EMI option, right? So we have tied up with a fintech firm uh, who provides a collateral fee loan uh, that the students can pay back in equated monthly installments. And you can use that in a 3 months to 12 months generally. Uh, there's a minimal interest rate that you will have to pay, something similar to what you buy an iPhone or a Samsung phone, right? Something very similar to that. So you can basically, uh, uh, divide your payment into multiple installments, right? So, all these details, and this is only for candidates in India, so well, nowhere across the world as of now. And you can explore more about it when you go to a website where you can find the details. So, I'm on to the last section, I will very quickly cover this. These are some of the student participation activities that we have conducted for many colleges in India, right? And we do a lot of engagement. So, ESG Game Show, I mean, already spoke about ESG certificate and the importance of sustainability in all the government policies, institutional policies, etc, etc. So we, we, we are in a very entertaining quiz called the ESG Game Show. We generally do it for corporates, but we have also done it for a couple of colleges. Uh, where we will try to do a leaderboard based quiz, uh, where participants can understand the basic concepts of ESNG and understand how they actually link to your everyday life, right? <laughs> Tell you that it's not a very broad vague concept that is available, but something which relates to each and every one of our lives. We also conduct ethics workshops, I think Amit has already covered this. And finally, we run these network of student volunteers called the Pin Network, wherein we work with, they work very closely with CFA Institute uh, to run guest lectures, 
events, conferences, etc. around finance area in their respective colleges. So your economics of CFA L1, <laughs> economics of CFA L1 gets broadly covered in semester 3 and semester 4 in the micro and macro. Okay. Same goes with derivatives, IDFF, SEM3. It majorly covers everything there. Then your portfolio management and wealth planning. Basically L1 pay in L1, you've got portfolio management. Almost everything gets covered in your PTSA. Same way alternatives, as you could recollect, IDF if there was a chapter, alternatives, correct? Ethical, we cover it in SEM 5, so we are always seeing that in our SEM 5. Quantitative of CFA L1 got covered in your probability and statistics of PNS 1. Why is that hypothesis testing, time value of money? Then corporate issuers, uh, it's more on the NPV, IRR, Raising, Miller, Monticliani and all that got covered in our business finance and financial mathematics. Okay, then equity investment, it's it's spread across again business finance and PTSA and fixed income, uh, which is right now going on FIP, fixed income products, broadly it covers everything. This is covering your CFA L1 uh, as uh, like you spoke on. The FSA, financial statement analysis, broadly it is not getting covered per se, but you have good knowledge of ratio analysis, uh, cash flow statement and all, that gets again a part of business finance. Then L2, economics, SEM4, macro, correct, bits and micro, bits and macro. Derivative, this is going to be in SEM4 and SEM5, financial engineering. Again, portfolio management, it's in SEM6, RMN, and quantitative methods, it's PS2. That's more about the uh, correlation and regression hypothesis testing. All right? Any questions you have for me? Yes, yeah, some of the subjects highlighted are only for the elective. Of, for the quantitative elective, huh? so have that in mind. SEM5 and SEM6.